Chapter 7 The Misplaced Attachment of Mr. John Dounce If we had to make a classification of society, there is our particular kind of men whom we should immediately set down under the head of old boys. In a column of most extensive dimensions, the old boys would require. To what precise causes the rapid advance of old boy population is to be traced, we are unable to determine. It would be an interesting and curious speculation, but, as we have not sufficient space to devote to it here, we simply state the fact that the number of the old boys have been gradually augmenting within the last few years, and that they are at this moment alarmingly on the increase. Upon a general review of the subject, and without considering it minutely in detail, we should be disposed to subdivide the old boys into two distinct classes, the gay old boys and the steady old boys. The gay old boys are paunchy old men in the disguise of young ones, who frequent the Quadrant and Regent Street in the daytime, the theaters, especially theaters under lady management at night, and who assume all the foppishness and levity of boys without the excuse of youth or inexperience. The steady old boys are certain stout old gentlemen of clean appearance, who are always to be seen in the same taverns, at the same hours every evening, smoking and drinking in the same company. There was once a fine collection of old boys to be seen round the circular table at Offley's every night, between the hours of half-past eight and half-past eleven. We have lost sight of them for some time. There were, and maybe still for aught we know, two splendid specimens in full blossom at the Rainbow Tavern in Fleet Street, who always used to sit in the box nearest the fireplace and smoked long cherry stick pipes which went under the table with the bowls resting on the floor. Grand old boys they were, fat, red-faced, white-headed old fellows, always there, one on one side of the table and the other opposite, puffing and drinking away in great state. Everybody knew them, and it was supposed by some people that they were both immortal. Mr. John Dounce was an old boy of the latter class. We don't mean immortal, but steady. A retired glove and braces maker, a widower, resident with three daughters, all grown up and all unmarried, in Cursor Street, Chancery Lane. He was a short, round, large-faced, tubbish sort of man with a broad-brimmed hat and a square coat, and had that grave but confident kind of role peculiar to old boys in general. Regular as clockwork, breakfast at nine, dress and titivate a little, down to the sir somebody's head, a glass of ale in the paper, come back again and take daughters out for a walk, dinner at three, glass of grog and pipe, nap, tea, little walk, sir somebody's head again, capital house, delightful evenings. There were Mr. Harris, the law stationer, and Mr. Jennings, the robe maker, two jolly young fellows like himself, and Jones, the barrister's clerk, rum fellow that Jones, capital company, full of anecdote. And there they sat every night till just ten minutes before twelve, drinking their brandy and water, and smoking their pipes, and telling stories, and enjoying themselves with a kind of solemn joviality particularly edifying. Sometimes Jones would propose a half-price visit to Drury Lane or Convent Garden to see two acts of a five-act play, and a new farce, perhaps, or a ballet, on which occasions the whole four of them went together. None of your hurrying and nonsense, but having their brandy and water first, comfortably, and ordering a steak and some oysters for their support against they came back, and then walking coolly into the pit when the rush had gone in, as all sensible people do, and did when Mr. Dounce was a young man, except when the celebrated Master Betty was at the height of his popularity, and then, sir, then, Mr. Dounce perfectly well remembered getting a holiday from business, and going to the pit doors at eleven o'clock in the forenoon, and waiting there till six in the afternoon, with some sandwiches and a pocket handkerchief, and some wine in a file, and fainting after all, with the heat and fatigue before the play began, in which situation he was lifted out of the pit into one of the dress boxes, sir, by five of the finest women of the day, sir, who compassionated his situation and administered restoratives, and sent a black servant, six foot high, in blue and silver livery next morning with their compliments, and to know how he found himself, sir, by God. 
Between the acts, Mr. Dounce and Mr. Harris and Mr. Jennings used to stand up and look round the house. And Jones, knowing fellow that Jones, knew everybody, pointed out the fashionable and celebrated lady so-and-so in the boxes, at the mention of whose name Mr. Dounce, after brushing up his hair and adjusting his neckerchief, would inspect the aforesaid lady so-and-so through an immense glass and remark either that she was a fine woman, very fine woman indeed, or that there might be a little more of her, eh, Jones? Just as the case might happen to be. When the dancing began, John Dounce and the other old boys were particularly anxious to see what was going forward on the stage. And Jones, wicked dog that Jones, whispered little critical remarks into the ears of John Dounce, which John Dounce retailed to Mr. Harris and Mr. Harris to Mr. Jennings, and they all four laughed until the tears ran down out of their eyes. When the curtain fell, they walked back together, two and two, to the steaks and oysters. And when they came to the second glass of brandy and water, Jones, hoaxing the scamp that Jones, used to recount how he had observed a lady in white feathers in one of the pit boxes gazing intently on Mr. Dounce all the evening, and how he had caught Mr. Dounce, whenever he thought no one was looking at him, bestowing ardent looks of intense devotion on the lady in return, on which Mr. Harris and Mr. Jennings used to laugh very heartily, and John Dounce more heartily than either of them, acknowledging, however, that the time had been when he might have done such things, upon which Mr. Jones used to poke him in the ribs and tell him he had been a sad dog in his time, which Mr. John Dounce with chuckles confessed. And after Mr. Harris and Mr. Jennings had preferred their claims to the character of having been sad dogs too, they separated harmoniously and trotted home. The decrees of fate and the means by which they are brought about are mysterious and inscrutable. John Dounce had led this life for twenty years and upwards, without wish for change or care for variety, when his whole social system was suddenly upset and turned completely topsy-turvy, not by an earthquake or some other dreadful convulsion of nature, as the reader would be inclined to suppose, but by the simple agency of an oyster. And thus it happened. Mr. John Dounce was returning one night from the Sir Somebody's Head to his residence in Cursitor Street, not tipsy, but rather excited, for it was Mr. Jennings's birthday, and they had had a brace of partridges for supper, and a brace of extra glasses afterwards, and Jones had been more than ordinarily amusing, when his eyes rested on a newly opened oyster shop on a magnificent scale, with natives laid one deep in circular marble basins in the windows, together with little round barrels of oysters directed to lords and baronets, and colonels and captains in every part of the habitable globe. Behind the natives were the barrels, and behind the barrels was a young lady of about five and twenty, all in blue and all alone. Splendid creature, charming face, and lovely figure. It is difficult to say whether Mr. John Dounce's red countenance, illuminated as it was by the flickering gaslight in the window before which he paused, excited the lady's risibility, or whether a natural exuberance of animal spirits proved too much for that staidness of demeanor which the forms of society rather dictatorially prescribe. But certain it is that the lady smiled, then put her finger upon her lip with a striking recollection of what was due to herself, and finally retired in oyster-like bashfulness to the very back of the counter. The sad dog sort of feeling came strongly upon John Dounce. He lingered. The lady in blue made no sign. He coughed. Still she came not. He entered the shop. "'Can you open me an oyster, my dear?' said Mr. John Dounce. "'Dare say I can, sir,' replied the lady in blue with playfulness. And Mr. John Dounce eat one oyster, and then looked at the young lady, and then eat another, and then squeezed the young lady's hand as she was opening the third, and so forth, until he had devoured a dozen of those at eight pence in less than no time. "'Can you open me a half dozen more, my dear?' inquired Mr. John Dounce. "'I'll see what I can do for you, sir,' replied the young lady in blue, even more bewitchingly than before." and Mr. John Dounce eat half a dozen more of those at eightpence. "'You couldn't manage to get me a glass of brandy and water, my dear, I suppose,' said Mr. John Dounce, when he had finished the oysters, in a tone which clearly implied his supposition that she could. "'I'll see, sir,' said the young lady, and away she ran out of the shop and down the street, her long auburn ringlets shaking in the wind in the most enchanting manner. 
Back she came again, tripping over the coal cellar lids like a whipping top, with a tumbler of brandy and water, which Mr. John Dounce insisted on her taking a share of, as it was regular ladies' grog. Hot, strong, sweet, and plenty of it. So, the young lady sat down with Mr. John Dounce in a little red box with a green curtain, and took a small sip of the brandy and water, and a small look at Mr. John Dounce, and then turned her head away and went through various other stereopantomimic fascinations, which forcibly reminded Mr. John Dounce of the first time he courted his first wife, and which made him feel more affectionate than ever. In pursuance of which affection, and actuated by which feeling, Mr. John Dounce sounded the young lady on her matrimonial engagements, when the young lady denied having formed any such engagements at all. She couldn't abear the men. They were such deceivers. Thereupon, Mr. John Dounce inquired whether this sweeping condemnation was meant to include other than very young men, on which the young lady blushed deeply. At least she turned away her head, and said Mr. John Dounce had made her blush. So, of course, she did blush. And Mr. John Dounce was a long time drinking the brandy and water, and, at last, John Dounce went home to bed and dreamed of his first wife, and his second wife, and the young lady, and partridges, and oysters, and brandy and water, and disinterested attachments. The next morning, John Dounce was rather feverish with the extra brandy and water of the previous night, and, partly in the hope of cooling himself with an oyster, and partly with the view of ascertaining whether he owed the young lady anything or not, went back to the oyster shop. If the young lady had appeared beautiful by night, she was perfectly irresistible by day, and, from this time forward, a change came over the spirit of John Dounce's dream. He bought shirt pins, wore a ring on his third finger, read poetry, bribed a cheap miniature painter to perpetuate a faint resemblance to a youthful face, with a curtain over his head, six large books in the background, and an open country in the distance. This he called his portrait. Went on altogether in such an uproarious manner that the three Miss Dounces went off on small pensions, he having made the tenement in Cursitor Street too warm to contain them, and in short, comported and demeaned himself in every respect like an unmitigated old Saracen, as he was. As to his ancient friends, the other old boys at the Sir Somebody said, he dropped off from them by gradual degrees. For even when he did go there, Jones, vulgar fellow that Jones, persisted in asking when it was to be, and whether he was to have any gloves together with the other inquiries of an equally offensive nature, at which not only Harris laughed, but Jennings also. So he cut the two all together and attached himself solely to the blue young lady at the smart oyster shop. Now comes the moral of the story, for it has a moral after all. The last mentioned young lady, having derived sufficient profit and emolument from John Dounce's attachment, not only refused when matters came to a crisis to take him for better or worse, but expressly declared, to use her own forcible words, that she wouldn't have him at no price. And John Dounce, having lost his old friends, alienated his relations, and rendered himself ridiculous to everybody, made offers successively to a schoolmistress, a landlady, a feminine tobacconist, and a housekeeper, and, being directly rejected by each and every one of them, was accepted by his cook, with whom he now lives, a hen-pecked husband, a melancholy monument of antiquated misery, and a living warning to all luxurious old boys. Chapter 8 The Mistaken Milliner A Tale of Ambition Miss Amelia Martin was pale, tallish, thin, and two and thirty, what ill-natured people would call plain, and police reports interesting. She was a milliner and a dressmaker, living on her business and not above it. If you had been a young lady in service, and had wanted Miss Martin, as a great many young ladies in service did, you would just have stepped up in the evening to number 47 Drummond Street, George Street, Euston Square, and after casting your eye on a brass door plate, one foot ten by one and a half, ornamented with a great brass knob at each of the four corners, and bearing the inscription, Miss Martin, millinery, and dressmaking in all its branches, you'd just have knocked two loud knocks at the street door, and down would come Miss Martin herself, in a merino gown of the newest fashion, 
black velvet bracelets on the genteelest principle, and other little elegancies of the most approved description. If Miss Martin knew the young lady who called, or if the young lady who called had been recommended by any other young lady whom Miss Martin knew, Miss Martin would forthwith show her upstairs into the two-pair front, and chat she would. So kind, and so comfortable. It really wasn't like a matter of business. She was so friendly. And then, Miss Martin, after contemplating the figure and general appearance of the young lady in service with great apparent admiration, would say how well she would look, to be sure, in a low dress with short sleeves, made very full in the skirts, with four tucks at the bottom, to which the young lady in service would reply in terms expressive of her entire concurrence in the notion, and of the virtuous indignation with which she reflected on the tyranny of Mrs., who wouldn't allow a young girl to wear a short sleeve of an afternoon. No, nor nothing smart, not even a pair of earrings, let alone hiding people's heads of hair under them frightful caps. At the termination of this complaint, Miss Amelia Martin would distantly suggest certain dark suspicions that some people were jealous on account of their own daughters, and were obliged to keep their servants' charms under, for fear they should get married first, which was no uncommon circumstance. Leastways, she had known two or three young ladies in service who had married a great deal better than their missuses, and they were not very good-looking either. And then the young lady would inform Miss Martin, in confidence, that how one of their young ladies was engaged to a young man and was a-going to be married, and Mrs. was so proud about it there was no bearing of her. But how she needn't hold her head quite so high neither, for, after all, he was only a clerk. And, after expressing due contempt for clerks in general, and the engaged clerk in particular, in the highest opinion possible of themselves and each other, Miss Martin and the young lady in service would bid each other good night in a friendly but perfectly genteel manner, and the one went back to her place, and the other to her room on the second floor front. There is no saying how long Miss Amelia Martin might have continued this course of life, how extensive a connection she might have established among young ladies in service, or what amount her demands upon their quarterly receipts might have ultimately attained, had not an unforeseen train of circumstances directed her thoughts to a sphere of action very different from dressmaking or millinery. A friend of Miss Martin's, who had long been keeping company with an ornamental painter and decorator's journeyman, at last consented, on being at last asked to do so, to name the day which would make the aforesaid journeyman a happy husband. It was a Monday that was appointed for the celebration of the nuptials, and Miss Amelia Morton was invited, among others, to honor the wedding dinner with her presence. It was a charming party, Summers Town the locality, and a front parlor the apartment. The ornamental painter and decorator's journeyman had taken a house, no lodgings nor vulgarity of that kind, but a house, four beautiful rooms, and a delightful little wash house at the end of the passage, which was the most convenient thing in the world, for the bridesmaids could sit in the front parlor and receive the company, and then run into the little wash house and see how the pudding and boiled pork were getting on in the copper, and then pop back into the parlor again, as snug and comfortable as possible. And such a parlor as it was! Beautiful Kidderminster carpet, six brand new cane bottom stained chairs, three wine glasses and a tumbler on each sideboard, farmer's girl and farmer's boy on the mantelpiece, girl tumbling over a stile, and boy spitting himself on the handle of a pitchfork, long white dimity curtains in the window, and, in short, everything on the most genteel scale imaginable. Then the dinner. There was baked leg of mutton at the top, boiled leg of mutton at the bottom, pair of fowls and leg of pork in the middle, porter pots at the corners, pepper, mustard, and vinegar in the center, vegetables on the floor, and plum pudding and apple pie and tartlets without number, to say nothing of cheese and celery and watercresses and all that sort of thing. As to the company, Miss Amelia Martin herself declared on a subsequent occasion that, much as she had heard of the ornamental painter's journeyman's connection, she never could have supposed it was half so genteel. There was his father, such a funny old gentleman, and his mother, such a dear old lady, and his sister, such a charming girl, and his brother, such a manly-looking young man, with such an eye. But even all these were as nothing 
when compared with his musical friends, Mr. and Mrs. Jennings Rodolph from White Conduit, with whom the ornamental painter's journeyman had been fortunate enough to contract an intimacy while engaged in decorating the concert room of that noble institution. To hear them sing separately was divine, but when they went through the tragic duet of Red Ruffian Retire, it was, as Miss Martin afterwards remarked, thrilling. And they, as Mr. Jennings Rodolph observed, why were they not engaged at one of the patent theaters? If he was to be told that their voices were not powerful enough to fill the house, his only reply was that he would back himself for any amount to fill Russell Square, a statement in which the company, after hearing the duet, expressed their full belief. So they all said it was shameful treatment, and both Mr. and Mrs. Jennings Rodolph said it was shameful too, and Mr. Jennings Rodolph looked very serious and said he knew who his malignant opponents were, but they had better take care how far they went. For if they irritated him too much, he had not quite made up his mind whether he wouldn't bring the subject before Parliament. And they all agreed that it would serve him right, and it was very proper that such people should be made an example of. So Mr. Jennings Rodolph said he'd think of it. When the conversation resumed its former tone, Mr. Jennings Rodolph claimed his right to call upon a lady, and the right being conceded, trusted Miss Martin would favor the company, a proposal which met with unanimous approbation whereupon Miss Martin, after sundry hesitatings and coughings, with a preparatory choke or two, and an introductory declaration that she was frightened to death to attempt it before such great judges of the art, commenced a species of treble cherubing, containing frequent allusions to some young gentleman of the name of Henry, with an occasional reference to madness and broken hearts. Mr. Jennings Rodolph frequently interrupted the progress of the song by ejaculating, Beautiful! Charming! Brilliant, oh, splendid, and etc. And at its close, the admiration of himself and his lady knew no bounds. Did you ever hear so sweet a voice, my dear? inquired Mr. Jennings Rodolph of Mrs. Jennings Rodolph. Never, indeed, I never did love, replied Mrs. Jennings Rodolph. Don't you think Miss Martin, with a little cultivation, could be very like Signora Mari Boney, my dear? asked Mr. Jennings Rodolph. Just exactly the very thing that struck me, my love answered Mrs. Jennings Rodolph. And thus the time passed away. Mr. Jennings Rodolph played tunes on a walking stick, and then went behind the parlor door and gave his celebrated imitations of actors, edge tools, and animals. Miss Martin sang several other songs with increased admiration every time, and even the funny old gentleman began singing. His song had properly seven verses, but as he couldn't recollect more than the first one, he sang that over seven times. Apparently very much to his own personal gratification. And then all the companies sang the national anthem with national independence, each for himself, without reference to the other, and finally separated, all declaring that they never had spent so pleasant an evening. And Miss Martin inwardly resolving to adopt the advice of Mr. Jennings Rodolph and to come out without delay. Now, coming out, either in acting or singing, or society or facetiousness, or anything else, is all very well, and remarkably pleasant to the individual principally concerned, if he or she can but manage to come out with a burst, and being out to keep out, and not go in again. But it does unfortunately happen that both consummations are extremely difficult to accomplish, and that the difficulties of getting out at all in the first instance, and if you surmount them, of keeping out in the second, are pretty much on a par, and no slight ones either. And so Miss Amelia Martin shortly discovered. It is a singular fact, there being ladies in the case, that Miss Amelia Martin's principal foible was vanity, and the leading characteristic of Mrs. Jennings Rodolph, an attachment to dress. Dismal wailings were heard to issue from the second floor front of number 47, Drummond Street, George Street, Euston Square. It was Miss Martin practicing. Half-suppressed murmurs disturbed the calm dignity of the White Conduit Orchestra at the commencement of the season. It was the appearance of Mrs. Jennings Rodolph in full dress that occasioned them. Miss Martin studied incessantly. The practicing was the consequence. Mrs. Jennings Rodolph talked gratuitously now and then. The dresses were the result. Weeks passed away. The white conduit season had begun and progressed and was more than half over. The dressmaking business had fallen off from neglect and its profits had dwindled away almost imperceptibly. A benefit night approached. 
Mr. Jennings Rodolph yielded to the earnest solicitations of Miss Amelia Martin and introduced her personally to the comic gentleman whose benefit it was. The comic gentleman was all smiles and blandness. He had composed a duet expressly for the occasion, and Miss Martin should sing it with him. The night arrived. There was an immense room, 97 sixpenneths of gin and water, 32 small glasses of brandy and water, 5 and 20 bottled ales, and 41 neguses. And the ornamental painter's journeyman, with his wife and a select circle of acquaintance, were seated at one of the side tables near the orchestra. The concert began. Song, sentimental, by a light-haired young gentleman in a blue coat and bright basket buttons. Applause. Another song, doubtful, by another gentleman in another blue coat and more bright basket buttons. Increased applause. Duet, Mr. Jennings Rodolph and Mrs. Jennings Rodolph, Red Ruffian, Retire. Great applause. Solo, Miss Julia Montague, positively on this occasion only. I am a friar. Enthusiasm. Original duet, comic, Mr. H. Taplin, the comic gentleman, and Miss Martin, the time of day. Bravo, bravo, cried the ornamental painter's journeyman's party, as Miss Martin was gracefully led in by the comic gentleman. Go to work, Harry, cried the comic gentleman's personal friends. Tap, 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 went the leader's bow on the music desk. The symphony began, and was soon afterwards followed by a faint kind of ventriloquial chirping, proceeding apparently from the deepest recesses of the interior of Miss Amelia Martin. "'Sing out!' shouted one gentleman in a white greatcoat. "'Don't be afraid to put the steam on, old gal!' exclaimed another. "'Tsss!' went the five-and-twenty bottled ales. "'Shame! Shame!' remonstrated the ornamental painter's journeyman's party. "'Tsss!' went the bottled ales again, accompanied by all the gins and a majority of the brandies. "'Turn them geese out!' cried the ornamental painter's journeyman's party with great indignation. "'Sing out!' whispered Mr. Jennings Rodolph. "'So I do,' responded Miss Amelia Martin. "'Sing louder,' said Mrs. Jennings Rodolph. "'I can't,' replied Miss Amelia Martin. "'Off! Off! Off!' cried the rest of the audience. "'Bravo!' shouted the painter's party. "'It wouldn't do. Miss Amelia Martin left the orchestra with much less ceremony than she had entered it, and, as she couldn't sing out, never came out. The general good humor was not restored until Mr. Jennings Rodolph had become purple in the face by imitating diverse quadrupeds for half an hour without being able to render himself audible. And, to this day, neither has Miss Amelia Martin's good humor been restored, nor the dresses made for and presented to Mrs. Jennings Rodolph, nor the local abilities which Mr. Jennings Rodolph once staked his professional reputation that Miss Martin possessed.